Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us uh, here in person in the legislative chambers or if you're watching at home. This is the Omaha Mayor's Commission for Citizens with Disabilities monthly meeting. My name is Wendy Hamilton, and I am the chair of this fearless group. And uh, I want to also say happy Cyber Monday, which is the day before Giving Tuesday, which is the Monday after Shop Small Saturday. Anyway, it's a very important week, something going on every day. So um, we did have a pre-meeting, and while we do have a quorum, um, our mi meeting minutes from October are very, very well done and detailed um, by our secretary, Natalie. Uh, she did a great job capturing our presentation uh, for Down Syndrome Awareness Month. Um, and with that and with some other pre-meeting business, I just didn't feel that we had enough time to devote the proper attention to reviewing those minutes. So we agreed as a group that we will review them over email and uh, do an email vote no later than November 30th, because that will mean that we've done all of the year's meeting minutes. They will have all been approved and we'll be ready to close 2018 knowing that we don't have any um, business to carry over into 2019 for the for the minutes. So thank you to the group um, for being here in the pre-meeting. A couple of other uh, points of business. Uh, today's meeting will be rebroadcast uh, at 7 p.m. on Tuesdays on Cox Channel 18. You can also view this meeting at, the, at our website, which is cityofomaha.org. Click on the mayor's office, then click on Disabilities Commission. The purpose of this meeting is a couple of different things. We want to be a resource to the community. We also want to allow our citizens who are doing great work to provide information back to us. And so what I'll do is I'll briefly read over a couple of pieces of our constitution of the Mayor's Commission for Citizens with Disabilities. Number one, first and foremost, we exist to promote the quality of life, accessibility, and equity in all aspects related to the City of Omaha on behalf of and in cooperation with the citizens of Omaha who experience disabilities. To that end, this commission advises the mayor, the city council, city department heads, and other City of Omaha personnel on issues of access, representation, employment, housing, and quality of life affecting city citizens with disabilities and their respective families. Like I said, we hope to serve as a resource for our Omaha citizens, and one of the ways that we've really expanded our efforts is on our Facebook page. So please do uh, find us, like us, follow us. We try to stay active. Um, the staff in the Human Rights and Relations Department does a great job of keeping photos updated and if there's a disability awareness month or event happening. So thank you to Kat for keeping that updated. There's a lot of other bullet points on our purpose and our constitution. Um, so the last piece that I will read for today is that we exist to promote awareness to the general public on the capabilities, the needs, and desires of Omaha citizens with disabilities. We are a volunteer group of commissioners. Um, some of us work within the disability community. Some of us um, experience it. Some of us do both. So I, we always remind our audience members to have you know, paper and pen handy or have your cell phone if you want to take some notes about anything that is shared or any questions you'd like to ask. Um, what I would like to do is have the commissioners introduce themselves. Please remember to um, speak slowly and clearly. Um, please share your name, your role on the commission, and the community which you represent. We will start all the way over to my right. Hi, my name is Natalie Simmons, and I am the secretary of the commission and a mental health advocate. And um, I'm also a grant writer with my own company, Dotted Eye Writing Services. And hi, my name is Ed Armstrong. I'm the vice chair, and I work for a company called QLI, um, which serves adults with brain and spinal cord injuries, and I represent persons with physical disability. 
I am Reverend Lisa Sherman. I am the pastor of Faith Christian Church here in Omaha, and I also serve on the state of Nebraska SISM team, which is the Critical Incident Stress Management Rapid Response Team. Um, and I am serving here because I have five special needs children um, that range in a wide variety of disabilities. Hello, everybody. My name is Mark Smith. I'm a faculty at the Monroe Meyer Institute, which is the University Center for Disabilities for the state of Nebraska that's located at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. I'm here uh, representing individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I'm also the parent uh, of an individual, a young adult with uh, an intellectual disability and a, the sibling of, uh, of an individual with intellectual disabilities. And I am a member of the commission. My name is Peter Seilers. And I am representing the deaf and hard of hearing community. I am on the board of the Nebraska Association of the Deaf. Thank you. And again, my name is Wendy Hamilton, and I represent uh, adult members, or excuse me, adults with autism spectrum disorders. I am the adult child of a parent with ASD, and uh, frequently represent Autism Society of Nebraska and other autism affiliated organizations. So thank you very much to our members. And speaking of our members, one of our presenters today uh, is, is actually a member of the commission. He's also invited a couple of guests to present with him. I want to welcome to the podium Dr. Seiler. And I also want to give him a shout out for rescheduling his presentation which uh, he graciously rescheduled from the fall. So I always learn from Dr. Seiler. I always laugh with Dr. Seiler. And I'm very excited to be a part of his presentation today. So thank you. And will you uh, be introducing your guests as well? Or would you like me to do that? You'll do that? Great. Thank you so much. I will be introducing them. We're not really sure how the uh, technology here is going to work, but uh, I think we've got it all figured out. I apologize. Make sure I'm looking in the right direction. I am happy to uh, be here in this particular role. Um, I presented back in September during uh, Deaf Awareness Week. Um, but we had some issues with our scheduling and our programming, and so we rescheduled that, and we are now going to address that topic. I have brought two individuals here with me today. Um, both represent the Nebraska Commission from the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. And first I'd like to um, just kind of explain that although I am a board member for the Nebraska Association for the Deaf, we represent deaf and hard of hearing individuals throughout the entire state of Nebraska. Which we at this point assume is a, representing about 158,000 people that um, are either deaf or hard of hearing from birth from birth to grave at that point. <laughs> um, and uh, that encompasses folks that um, are veterans, that are senior citizens, that are babies, um, adults. And so we want to make sure that we're representing each of those um, individuals' needs. We brought with us a list of c what we consider legislative issues. And we want to, uh, one thing that we want to change is the term of hearing impaired. Um, which has a negative connotation to it, and it implies that something is broken, and certainly we are not a broken person. Um, we have a sense, a sensory, that is lost or is diminished, but other than that, uh, we're capable of doing just about anything, and we are fine. As the um, oldest state organization of and by a disability group, um, we were founded in 1902, here in the state of Nebraska, and we've been running as an organization since then. I'd love to take a moment to explain everything that we do here today, and I have given a copy of our brochure to um, each of the commissioners. Um, and you'll see um, some of the different services, um, which include helping parents um, and advocating with parents um, in regards to their child's education to make sure that deaf and hard of hearing children do receive a quality education that is afforded to them. In 
And in the trifold brochure that I've shared with you uh, today, as well as a letter from the Nebraska Association for the Deaf, which basically um, it encompasses all the different things that we're hoping to accomplish in the legislative sessions. It truly is the best resource in the state of Nebraska in regards to anybody who's deaf or hard of hearing. Um, and we also have the Nebraska Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing in the state, and they provide a tremendous amount of resources and services, and certainly I could not stand here and describe all of them. There are a few choice uh, duties that our commission does very, very well. Uh, they do everything well, I should, <laughs> I should say that. But on that point, I would like to go ahead and introduce two individuals, the first being Kim Davis. She is the... Um, Advocacy Specialist uh, for the Nebraska Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Thank you, Dr. Seiler, for the warm welcome, and thank you, Commissioners, for having me here today. As an Advocacy Specialist, um, primarily my job is an, to be an advocate, um, but when in, real, when in reality, I actually serve as six different positions. Um, I work, excuse me, regions. Um, we, in the state of Nebraska, have um, the state broken down into specific regions, and Omaha is one of those regions. Um, in, of course, we have a lot of programs and services, and I understand that back in June, someone from, an, from our agency came and um, gave a description of the different services that we have to offer um, for deaf individuals, hard of hearing individuals, and even speech impaired individuals in regards to um, getting telecommunications devices and equipment, um, such as amplified phones, uh, light signalers, um, some various resources um, that folks can use in regards to enhance um, their phone services. But another popular program um, that I have actually shared with each of the commissioners today um, lists all of the varying services that we have. We have a hearing aid bank for refurbished hearing aids, and we're always um, searching for um, hearing aids that folks aren't using anymore. Uh, maybe they find that they're no longer needed or even that they're broken. We would still collect those um, so that we could refurbish them and then present them to individuals um, who may not be able to get them any other way. We know that insurance doesn't really cover the cost of hearing aids. Um, in fact, very few insurance policies do. Um, that is uh, one of the issues that um, are on the legislative floor, that we are looking to have a um, coverage for children to receive hearing aids, but that only covers those um, 0 to 21. And so hopefully you would be in support of that bill when it comes um, due for that vote. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you repeat the age range that you just said for insurance coverage for hearing aids? I believe the bill um, that we're presenting will cover ages 0 to 21. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and we, I, I, we're going to repeat the question for our viewers uh, because we, don't, um, we didn't have that interpreted. So again, the question on the floor was, what is the age range um, for that bill? And we believe that it is 0 to 21 that we're presenting. Um, it could be maxing out at age 18, but I'm pretty sure it's 21. And there's some um, other popular programs that, and services that we offer. But what I would like to talk about today is about training. Our agency provides a lot of training here within the city of Omaha. Um, law enforcement training is one of those different services that we've provided in the past. The Omaha Police Department is currently receiving training, um, and it's pretty remarkable how we started that um, partnership. We had a law enforcement task force group, and one of the captains, um, who has now since retired, um, Captain Mike McGee was responsible for providing training um, for over 800 officers in the Omaha Police Department. And um, in our discussions during the task force, they decided um, well, they were trying to answer the question of how we could best break down communication barriers. 
And oftentimes, police officers encounter, encounter a deaf person while driving. Um, and yes, deaf people do drive. <laughs> we are very visual drivers. We use all of the mirrors and come in, in, on our vehicles. And oftentimes, we still don't recognize the uh, red and blue lights that tend to go off during the day if a police officer is pulling you over. But at night, it's very visible and very clear. So you, it's, it's easy to know when you need to pull over. Um, but sometimes during the day, um, we may not see those lights as well. However, um, we have common sense, and if you see other cars pulling over, essentially that means something's going on and you shall too should pull over. Uh, sometimes we uh, don't have common sense and we just keep on driving. And that may give the police officer um, a suspicion that someone is being resistant. And so they may want to then pull over that individual. So what we can do then is both educate the community to make their, sure they're aware, but also to educate our police department so that they may be aware of different communication barriers that may take place if there was such a situation um, that they were dealing with a member of that population and how they can best break down that communication barrier without feeling threatened, without thinking that um, you know their safety is at risk. So that's what we've been training the Omaha Police Department officers is to not always look to that as a threat initially, but that there, there may be a communication barrier. We give them information about how to deal with deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind individuals so that they're able to um, work through whatever issues that they're encountering. So in that training, we provide sign language. Um, it's American Sign Language Crash Course is essentially what it is. It's all day, and it is literally a crash course. We try to hone in on certain vocabulary terms and commonly used phrases that the police officers have identified that they regularly use. Um, we've had a couple of different levels at this point. We started our second level and I'm highly impressed with the officers um, that they are actually able to communicate, use sentence structures, use their gestures and body language to um, drive home the point of the communication. Um, so we, we certainly could not have uh, conquered this without collaboration. We're also um, with Douglas County Corrections providing um, training to their recruit, the new recruits. And then eventually we will get to some of the veteran officers as well. Um, so these are deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing individuals that may be incarcerated. Um, and so we're trying to, again, break down those communication barriers. Oftentimes these folks feel very isolated without this communication access. And so we want to provide officers the ability to communicate directly with these individuals as they're incarcerated. Um, and at that point, oh, I'm sorry, did you have a question? And I guess I should ask, if there's any questions up until now, I'll take those. Um, no, we actually resolved it. I'm just taking notes, and I had a, one question, but I got it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your time. They thought they had a question, but they, but they resolved it. Very good. We were just repeating that for the camera. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I should ask you or if I should ask at the end. Uh, maybe we should just go ahead and go on to the next presenter, um, and then we can wait until the end. I'm going to go ahead and present my colleague, um, and she is our behavioral health services program specialist, and I'm sure her and Natalie would have lots to chat about. <laughs> <laughs> so Carly Wires, I'll let her take over now. Hello, commissioners. Thank you, thank you for having me here today. Again, um, I'm Carly Wires. I also work at the Nebraska Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing with Kim. My role is as, as a behavioral health specialist coordinator. Our agency has five regions throughout the state of Nebraska. However, I am a state, statewide coordinator, so I travel throughout the entire state and uh, we provide behavioral health services. So I'll give you a synopsis of a research study that um, deals with deaf and hard of hearing folks and mental health. As a deaf person who's frustrated um, about mental health concerns, do you think that that may have the same par paralleled experiences with hearing individuals? They're looking for services to address their needs. Oftentimes, deaf or hard of hearing people do not receive services the same way that their hearing peers do. And there's a 
there's a wide range of reasons as to why. As a deaf or hard of hearing person, research shows that they're at a high risk to, in receiving any sort of mental health services. Um, and the reasons can be varied, but the most priority uh, is the lack of communication access. And this can be within their family, the environments that they are in, and when that occurs, and then they go out to seek services, they're not always able to acquire a full range of services that they need. Now, when we start talking about domestic violence situations or um, critical emergency um, first responder type of situations, in that very situation, um, in a domestic violence situ situation, your first thought is, you know, run and hide in a closet. But then if you do that, you have no opportunity to contact 911. You, you don't have that ability to have that direct communication. Or if you were in a medical emergency and um, you are suddenly rushed to the hospital, but there's no interpreter. Um, or maybe you have been a sexual assault victim and you're trying to get a rape kit and they're trying to explain to you what that rape kit might mean, and although there's no interpreter um, present, and you're, you're not able to really kind of understand what's taking place in that scenario. So there's lots of different situations where you think bringing in an interpreter might provide full access, but there are several factors that deaf and hard of hearing people experience that still prevent them from, re from receiving full access. Um, one of those examples might be um, bringing in a electronic version of an interpreter, um, a distant interpreter called Marty or video remote interpreting. Sometimes that uh, video streaming freezes and it buffers and so then communication is altered. Sometimes the hospital is reaching out to a live on-site interpreter yet none is available. So then what's the next step? How does that person receive access to communication? So myself as a behavioral services coordinator, that's kind of my job. I'm trying to recognize all these varying behavior, excuse me, communication barriers and breaking those down, both on the side for mental health services, plus just in general with deaf and hard of hearing individuals, teaching these individuals how to break down some of these communication barriers on their own, talking about self-care and how to um, educate themselves and be educated that there might be some barriers out there that you, you got to kind of think through before you encounter those situations. So we want to make sure that folks are taking care of themselves and they know how to take care of themselves, know how to advocate for themselves, but also to educate the community to understand that there's some cultural differences, there's some biases, there's some understanding, some different layers that need to happen within the mental health community, especially with those who are deaf and hard of hearing. And then when you're getting actual services, you get it through not through a third party, through an interpreter, but it's more through direct services. Um, maybe the interpreter doesn't truly understand uh, mental health services and they're not able to fully encompass the, the, the intent of different services that are being provided by a therapist. So the best way to deliver those services is by direct communication. Here in the state of Nebraska, we have eight providers that are fluent in sign language. Now, I say fluent in sign language, but that does not mean that they per are perfect in their skills. But they do have potential for direct interactions in a person's own language. But that's only eight providers in the entire state of Nebraska, and certainly that's not enough. So what I'm doing is going out and providing training the best that I can to make sure that there's a cultural awareness and understanding of how to provide the services as best as we can here in the state of Nebraska. Some things that I've done here right recently is, for example, if you're in a domestic violence situation, you're in a closet hiding, you're not sure what to do, I actually took time to um, test, give a testimony on the legislative floor about our next gen 911. Um, this is not just for those one-off situations, but these will encounter our, I mean, help our um, communities in regards to, you know, certain situations that we might find ourselves in that texting 911 would be essential. Um, also, if you're not able to bring in an interpreter right away, you know, is it the better option to go to pen and paper or what are our second, you know, what, what second strategies in that? 
Um, you can't ever break down complete, completely those communication barriers because we don't live in a perfect world. But I'm trying to break them down as much as possible. So thank you for your time. So I will uh, finish up, and I apologize for taking up a lot of the commissioner's time, but I did want to take a moment to expand on a few things. About our, re our legislative agenda, the first is to make not all of 911 text access accessible, and that's despite your disability, deaf, hard of hearing, or deaf blind. And hearing people need this just as much as, as we mentioned. Um, Carly shared one valid um, scenario where somebody is experiencing a domestic violence situation and maybe hiding in a closet or a closed off room, but needing to access emergency services, but certainly doesn't want to just yell out or use a phone, but you wouldn't be able to do, um, to text, not here in Douglas County. Um, from right now, we know that we have two counties that are completely accessible. Lancaster is one of them, and Lincoln County is another. And there may be more, but um, we need, you know, in an age of technology, we should really, you know, roll this out statewide. And that's one of the things that we're addressing this next session. We're also trying to make more places uh, communication access uh, accessible. Uh, TD Ameritrade is not completely accessible to deaf and hard of hearing folks. They use um, some sort of uh, technology um, and um, kind of put people into a small section within the stadium um, with a tablet and then in uh, the University of Nebraska Lincoln in the football stadium at Memorial Stadium. Um, there, and, and namely many, many other places um, that um, are not accessible. And so we have quite the fight on our hands. All of our state agencies and city agencies have websites. Um, occasionally there are things that are videoed, um, however they are um, they are not being, uh, cl closed captioning is not being added to them. And so we would like that to um, change because uh, with the American with Disabilities Act, um, that is something that should be happening. Um, and right now the only solution is to file a complaint. Um, so we have a lot of fighting to do and we have to pick our battles, if you will. And what we try to do is focus in on those collaborative efforts. And one of them is here with, the, with you, this commission. We depend upon you to help us bring things to light. Not just with deaf and hard of hearing and deaf blind, but we have um, folks that have other disabilities such as mobility disabilities. And um, I, I myself, I'm a recovering alcoholic. You know, So where are those services being provided within the city and the state? So again, we depend upon you the, as the commission to collaborate with us to help us um, fight those, stand, those, those barriers, especially to those of us who have you know, two and three layers of disabilities. And we are more than welcome to take questions from the commission at this time. You ready? Um, I have a question for uh, your two invited presenters. Um, I'm wondering what in your background as far as experience and training you went through to uh, get to your current positions. I was particularly interested in Carly and her work in mental health as that's, I've been trained as a therapist in my background. And I have a follow-up question to that. Fantastic. Oh, I thank you for your question. Um, I went to Gallaudet University. I majored in communication studies and sociology. Um, I uh, one day would like to become a counselor. That requires graduate school, and I have to get there. Um, now, I do not provide direct services in my role at all. What I do is provide resource referral. Um, so my training experience, at me as a deaf individual, 
um, I can understand. Um, I have that empathetic um, ability to, to connect with individuals who experience things and do not receive direct services. And then um, uh, as my training as the behavioral health services coordinator, I received lots of training for that. And then, like I said, I would like to continue that training by going on to graduate school. Thank you. And then you wanted to know, as far as me, um, I did not have any specific training um, for an advocacy specialist. I think I, it was just kind of uh, Im embedded in within me. <laughs> I just kind of um, understanding the process. I've faced many challenges as a deaf person. Some I haven't experienced directly, but I've experienced with other consumers. Um, you know, I, I'm a strong belief that um, um, in, in guiding a person, um, but I also also believe that the best advocate is you yourself. So what I try to do is present um, the individual with all of the different resources, kind of like planting that seed and then fostering that seed and growth by watering it. And so when I advocate for a person, um, I also educate the providers. Um, maybe they're not sure what their obligations are. Um, so I will share that information with them. Um, but I also address it with that consumer. And then when that person comes back again, they won't have to start all the way over. You know, They will take that opportunity for them to um, start on their own. And, and maybe I come back with them the second time, and I may have to do some you know, reminding, but it's directly with the consumer so that that individual, as they continue to come back to that provider, they can speak to their rights and know what their rights are. Oftentimes, as individuals with disabilities, um, knowing our rights is what's kind of key. That's what's essential to receiving the services that are needed. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do is advocate, teach them how to advocate for themselves, not so much advocate on their behalf. That's my approach to that system. Okay. One, one last question. Um, you had talked, Carly, about the fact that there are not enough providers, mental health providers in the state for working with the deaf and hard of hearing community. Um, can you speak to how many folks are not receiving services or or how many therapists might be needed in order that uh, individuals don't necessarily slip through the cracks. Um, that's always a concern I have is that folks that need services and supports to be successful in their community of choice don't have them available. So I wondered if you had a, an estimate or idea of the shortfall. That's a very, question, very, very valid question. I don't know that we have an exact science to that because what kind of services they're looking for may vary. Um, maybe it's family counseling. Maybe it's drug and alcohol services. Those are two completely different um, venues, if you will. Sure. Two different types of therapists um, that work that. So we don't have a perfect number. Um, but I would just say that we're lacking. We are lacking entirely. Um, maybe someone might go somewhere and receive services, but they may not fully understand directly um, with that particular diagnosis and how they can cope. Um, there's just a lot of things that are lacking. Um, so they may be able to go to a therapist with um, an interpreter, um, but being able to cope and um, you know, kind of understand that mental health diagnosis, those numbers really vary. So it, it, it's really hard to respond to that question. Thank you. Um, the, I just wanted to take a quick moment for the people who are watching. Um, I, I, for communication access, I just wanted to take a quick explanation with um, the television. Sometimes we're making some adjustments here so that we are providing the best services for our audience who can both hear as well as the audience who um, rely upon the sign language. So your patience as we work through these issues are very much appreciated. And I'm sorry, and any other questions from the commissioners? You know I have questions. I always have about a million, but one of the... Shoot. Oh, sorry, you want me to wait? Yeah, I'll just... Okay. There we go. Perfect. And I would also like to thank everybody for their patience and our rock star interpreters for uh, 
adjusting. <laughs> so one of my biggest questions uh, uh, relates to something you said, Dr. Seiler, which was how you depend upon groups like the like this commission to help uh, with resources and awareness. So the legislative issues handout that you've shared with us, it says 2018, and you highlighted a couple of areas that will also carry over into 2019. Is it safe to say that, like, can we share this document or will you be revising one specific to 2019? Because I'd like to share this with some, some other advocacy groups. Yes, absolutely. Please, by all means, <laughs> share them widely. Okay. <laughs> um, then the the board for the Nebraska Com um, Association for the Deaf, we vote on this in our biennial conference, and so we it, we develop this with the intention for people to see it. Um, so yes, as you know, we are. Um, we are not completed with our work from 2018, so we have some things that have carried over to 2019. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes. I, I so wish sign language, and especially ASL, was taught in schools alongside with French and German, that there was uh, an, an option um, for our, young people to start out learning this language. So my question is, do all the major universities or state schools in Nebraska have solid sign language um, programs, um, meaning um, only eight fluent interpreters through the state in that capacity? You're right, that needs to grow. So how do we um, let our young people graduating high school know where the programs are to go in and to look at moving forward to get certified as an interpreter? Oh, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, and the, that's a very good question. Um, one of our roles here at the Nebraska Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing is to promote awareness and knowledge of sign language, as well as promote the growth of sign language interpreting as a career. Um, in grade school, K through 12, kindergarten through 12th grade, um, it is available as a world language, learning sign language. Um, it is recognized, rather, as part of the curriculum. But the question becomes, who is qualified to actually teach the language in a classroom? And so I think that's one of the barriers. Um, there are a lot of schools that are out there that use American, Ameri well, sign language um, clubs, and they have them after school. Mm. And as far as at colleges and universities, um, I actually teach a class um, for credit, and then there's some that are for non-credit. But for interpreting training programs, there's only one. You should be proud. It's here in Omaha at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. There's an actual sign language interpreter training program there. And, and hopefully that answers your question. Um, Thank you. But yes, you're right. It does need to grow. And Carly is, um, I would like to clarify something. Um, when you had mentioned that there were eight um, interpreters, no, there's actually eight um, mental health service providers who can sign directly with their um, patients and consumers. Oh, thank you. But for that, that their levels may not be as fluent as you would see in a sign language interpreter. But yes, I do agree with you that I, I think all schools should provide lang sign language because I think that would make a difference amongst the student body. It could give career opportunities for some of those individuals, um, which is another reason why we set up um, sign language clubs. Um, at Roper's Elementary School, um, which is in Lincoln, um, Nebraska, we actually have 75th and 6th graders that signed up for this ASL club. Um, it's amazing. But the intention here is to teach sign language so that maybe one or two of these kiddos will decide to become an mm -hmm. interpreter or something like that in the future. And I would like to add a little bit more on this particular topic of interpreters. Uh, the Nebraska Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, as an agency, license our sign language interpreters for community interpreters here in the state of Nebraska. The Nebraska Department of Education establishes their rules 
for who can interpret within a classroom setting for K through 12. So we have two different communities of interpreters. And an interpreter could interpret in both settings if they were said licensed. But the reason why there is a difference is because in community interpreting, it requires more knowledge, such as what would be required in legal interpreting or medical services interpreting, mm -hmm. mental health services interpreting. These are all, there's all different kinds of nuances and jargon that go into each of these types of segments of specialty um, types of settings. And then we have education, which basically encompasses kindergarten through 12th grade. We also have um, sign language represented in their world languages curriculum. American Sign Language is listed there. So public schools can offer it. But as uh, Kim had previously mentioned, that requires the school to have a, an instructor who has that endorsement in teaching sign language. And there's not many folks who do. Um, so in fact, to the best of my knowledge, there's only three. Uh, the University of Nebraska at Omaha, University of Nebraska in Lincoln, and I think there's one more college, and I apologize, I can't name that college right now because the name is slipping, but those three are the only ones who actually employ individuals who are s certified and have that endorsement. So we, we would also like to present that as an option to keep it as um, for foreign credit. Um, Sign language is truly a second language, uh, such as um, Native American. Second in language, such as Native American, as opposed to um, French or Spanish. Um, so it's a second language, um, and it. I think I'm giving you more information than you've asked, but <laughs> definitely there's there's there's. Hopefully, I've given you some information. Thank you. Thank you. And with that? Oh, no, I have more. <laughs> <laughs> I thought oh. I only had one more, but then I'm just learning. I always learn so much from you, Dr. Seiler. OK, so I'll just ask both of them. I think one is uh, for Carly, and the other one can be answered by whomever wants to. Um, I, I believe it was Carly when you were talking about um, training for, I think, I apologize, I don't remember if it was Kim or Carly when you were talking about training for the Omaha Police Department um, and how to best interact with and communicate, sorry, yeah, Kim, um, and communicate with um, deaf or hard of hearing drivers. One thing I missed, and I apologize if you said it, who determines or how is it determined who gets that training on the force? Is it mandatory? I might have missed that. And then my second question is um, maybe just as a refresher, if somebody could share with us the different um, forms of sign language. I know ASL is the most common and is you know what we've been talking about being offered in the schools, but I know there are other types of sign language and I'm curious if those are just no longer, um, like if they're sort of a dying or phasing out way of communicating. Sure. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, in regards to the training uh, with the police officers, it, it varies. Um, it depends upon um, their desire um, to learn. It's not mandatory. Um, Omaha Police Department decided to just kind of open it up and say that they were going to be teaching, you know, sign language for communication uh, courses and people needed to sign up. I think all in all, uh, Carly and I, and we partner in our training, and I want to say we have first level, we have taught about 150, I think about 150 officers, which is not bad out of 800, you know, the 800 that we have. And I understand that some of those officers, um, we've met two that are incredible. Um, they actually have family members um, who are deaf, and so they came in with some skills. And so they are actually working to get um, certified, if you will, or endorsed with a special certification through the Omaha Police Department precinct to be able to provide 
um, direct communication and um, it's something that's done within the precinct uh, or within the headquarters that they provide to those officers um, that they are able to um, substantiate that they do have this fluency in this language and that they can communicate directly with individuals using that language. Um, in regards to American Sign Language, American Sign Language was recognized as a language in, in the 70s. Uh, 1970s at that. Um, so that's when it officially was recognized as a language. Now there are other signing systems and those systems are typical, um, typically used within the K through 12 grade school um, ages. And those can be um, signing exact English or otherwise known as C. And that's where you sign in English order. You provide <coughs> past and future tense. Um, and then we have PSE, which is, which is Pigeon Sign Language, um, Pigeon Signed English, which is sign language in English order. Both of the C and the PSE borrow from the American Sign Language, but they use uh, more initialized signings, less facial expressions, more mouth movements. Um, American Sign Language, 80% of the language is facial expressions and gestures, and 20% of that is based on vocabulary. Um, so you might notice that as Dr. Seiler and myself and Carly, as we are signing, you can see that we are expressing ourselves um, facially as well. The same way that hearing folks use intonation. Um, otherwise, you sound very monotone. And so we use facial expressions the same way that you use your voice to express what you're trying to express. I mean, it truly is a beautiful language. Thank you. One more question. Um, with uh, the, as we see more and more um, early hearing detection with infants after they're, right after they're born, um, is the association working with families in terms of identifying services and supports for families who have a newly born uh, infant with uh, hearing loss? So what you're referring to is the early hearing and detection intervention program. Yes. Otherwise known as EDI. Yes. Nebraska Association for the Deaf is also as, um, involved as the state advisory committee for that program. Most of their work is on detection. Um, babies that may be demonstrating some symptoms of uh, deafness or hard of hearing. We do not support the, the use of the term hearing loss because that makes parents grieve longer uh, because they see that word as a true loss, which ends up being heartbreaking. Um, so we want to label them appropriately that they are truly deaf or hard of hearing and allow them to move forward. Um, and I just, that's not an, an important point, an important, important point, but just something to help us to help parents as they receive this information. So as new babies are born, hospitals test their hearing, and if they do, are not able to hear something, then they um, advise the parents that they then need to be referred to their provider to be tested, to test the baby again within the next six months. And once they are then tested again and it's confirmed that there is um, either deafness or hearing, a hard of hearing, then there are some resources provided to the family regarding language development, uh, parent support, um, maybe a deaf mentor might be uh, introduced to them, and then there are some other groups and organizations. And one of them is um, Hands and Voices, which is a parent support group. And also, um, they have established a program that's called Guide by Your Side within um, the Hands and Voices world. And what they do is they, ex they uh, assign a guide to the family um, who may have similar experiences so that parents can feel kind of a relationship with someone who has gone through this the way that they are getting ready to go through this. And they're there to provide um, assistance to um, accessing all of those resources. And then... We, as deaf individuals, we are 
once those children, but now all grown up. So we ourselves have experiences. Um, and we've kind of figured out what works and what doesn't work. That's a very, very good question to ask. Thank you for asking. And Kim would like to add something as well. With the Nebraska Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, we collaborate with all of these different organizations, such as Nebraska Association for the Deaf and Hands and Voices. We also have a statewide advocacy um, individual who is all about the education, and they they get involved with parents regarding IEP planning, um, the different educational needs that that child may have, and what parents may need to know. And sometimes when parents attend IEP meetings, it's quite a challenge. You're the one person who's the parent and everyone else are the professionals. Um, so that's where Guide by Your Side and Nebraska Association for the Deaf is fantastic because they're able to give our parents choices and provide lots of different resources that are available out there as well. So wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Oh, and thank you so much for having us. Dr. Seiler, will you be returning for announcements? Because we can just start with you. Yes. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for your patience as we uh, transition cameras. Um, thank you so very much to Dr. Seiler, Kim, and Carly for your presentation today. I think we've all learned a great deal and appreciate the uh, dialogue. Um, I want to also thank with hearty hands uh, our wonderful interpreters, Jamie and Pam, uh, who were all over today. So thank you so much. Um, thank you for our tech support, everybody who helped make today's meeting possible. We are going to uh, quickly have an opportunity for members to give announcements if there's anything um, that their organizations or affiliated community groups would like to share. We'll start again with Natalie. I don't have anything today. Um, I'd just like to, um, I guess I mentioned this um, before, but um, my role at QLI is as an adaptive sports specialist and uh, just wanted to remind the folks in Omaha that there is some adaptive rock climbing available um, at Approach Climbing Gym, um, which is located, um, I think it's like 72nd and L Street um, down there, but they have adaptive rock climbing harnesses that are just available anytime um, for persons with physical disabilities who want to go rock climbing. So um, just, uh, just want to put a pitch out there for, for any active people there. Pitch. A pitch. <laughs> I would like to say for Nancy, she's not here, she represents our visually impaired community. Um, but on December 9th, the Ruth Sokolov Christmas party for the visually impaired children gather. And if you have not learned about this, man, it is amazing. They partner with West Roads Mall and all their, all their uh, retail stores in the mall. Hundreds and thousands of children come. High school age children are able to volunteer to help be guides. And what they do is they give each child $100 to go Christmas shopping for their family. I am very blessed because my son Gabriel has participated in this for the last four years. So I want to give um, a, a huge thanks to the Nebraska Foundation for the Visually Impaired Children, to the Ruth Sokoloff um, Foundation, and also to West Roads Mall and um, all the retailers that open up early at 10 a.m. and do this amazing thing um, for the visually impaired children throughout the uh, community of, of Omaha and and, and broader. Um, I just want to say thanks to our presenters today. That was ex exceptionally interesting and, and informative, and, but I have nothing else to add. Thanks. I want to thank my co-presenters today that gave up their business schedule to come today and share what the community does in their disability field. So thank you so much for coming. I also wanted to add a couple of things. Uh, presently, uh, people are becoming more excited about 
open captioned at theaters. It is still not as many as we would like, uh, but two or three theaters are now offering open caption movies. The Lincoln Avenue, Grand Avenue, Marcus Theater is offering open caption at least one movie on Saturday. And so you can contact them to get the list of options. Uh, Council Bluff AMC also offers one movie on Saturdays and Wednesdays. Just one movie, but still it's open caption, so a person can sit and enjoy that. Uh, we have a few small theaters that are offering some private independent theaters, one in Dundee and one um, downtown. Film streams. Uh, it's a downtown theater, and they are, those small private theaters are also offering open caption movies. So I just need to, uh, and Wendy gave me that. It's Filmstream is the name of the theater. So these, it's just wonderful. These, these theaters are just wonderful to provide that so that we can just sit and watch the movie and enjoy it. Some people feel that they don't want to use that technology that they have, the open view. Um, some people are not just used to that kind of technology machine and just like to watch the captions on the screen. March 13th to April 15th is Deaf History Month. And presently we have no activities planned, but I will let you know that of anything that will be coming up in the future. Great, thank That's you so all. much. How's our time? And okay, give everyone on Giving Tuesday tomorrow. Give to your favorite nonprofits. <laughs> um, and uh, as we wrap, uh, is it still recording? Maybe? Okay. Um, I will just share very briefly that this is, uh, I will be resigning from the commission and um, I've prepared a statement that I will share on our Facebook page and our website. I've informed the commissioners. It's a very, very bittersweet decision. Um, but in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting and just say that it has been my sincerest honor and pleasure and privilege to uh, serve my city in this way alongside these people and as well as those that aren't here today and the commissioners that um, ro rotated off the commission when I first started. So, um, but I'm not going anywhere. You haven't heard the last of me. So thank you. <laughs>